to our first semester of Old Testament interpretation. My name is Brennan Breed, and along with uh, Professor Yoder, I'll be the second half of our teaching team. Uh, I'm an Episcopalian uh, who happens to work at a Presbyterian church. Uh, I work at First Presbyterian Marietta, uh, which is north of, jo- uh, of Atlanta, but still in Georgia. So it's a little bit of a drive from here, Uh, but one of my best friends is the pastor there. Uh, And actually there's a few pastors there who all have connections to Columbia Seminary, so it's a pretty tight connection to our school. Uh, I am the theologian in residence there, so I teach classes and things like that. A bit more challenging in a time of COVID, but it's uh, it works, uh, and I also am uh, associate professor of Old Testament here at Columbia Theological Seminary. So welcome, and we are all so excited to have you here. Uh, the, you were asked a question uh, by Professor Yoder uh, before you came to this video, and that question was, "What do you think the Old Testament is? What is the Old Testament?" Now, uh, I haven't seen your your answers uh, by the time I've made this video, but we have started uh, pretty much every year that we've taught this course together with that exact same question. So I've got some ideas. Maybe some of you uh, have uh, uh, broken the mold, but I've got some ideas about what things that you might have said. Um, a lot of people will say things uh, like uh, it is a, a history book um, about uh, ancient uh, Israel or ancient Israel and Judah. So I might say, I've got a little whiteboard here. I might say something like history. And I might say Israel and Judah. So history and Israel and Judah. Okay, we might say something like that. We might say um, it is the story. We can say a story here. A story of God's um, covenant with Moses and uh, something like that. We'll, We'll put some characters here. Moses and David People like Ruth and Esther are a part of this story. It has to do with uh, Judaism in some way, but we'll, we'll talk about that and some other associated words. Um, uh, it has to do with the ancient world. The ancient world here. So we might say it's also a a, a book about the covenant with Israel. Sorry, it's a bit hard to read my writing here, uh, but it's a little whiteboard. So these these have to do with kind of history and the past and ancient Israel and ancient Judah, uh, about David and Moses and uh, uh, the the kind of great stories of uh, the matriarchs and patriarchs, um, Rachel and Leah and so on. Now, that, there's another kind of type of answer that we could give, and that's that um, they are stories with a plot. Right, there's plot, and then there's characters. There's characters, right? There's some poetry in the Bible. There's poems or songs. Sorry. Stories, plot, characters, poetry. There's songs. Right? There's... Um, uh, there are um, uh, villains, right? So like King Ahab is one of the villains in the Elijah stories, right? So we have all of these um, uh, kind of literary things that we can say about the text, right? Uh, we can also say um, that there are, uh, there, there's, there's more that we can say about the Bible too. It's the Bible in part because it has to do with us. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's about our relationship with God. So it's about our relationship with God. It's about us today. We might say it's about uh, the Jewish community today. Um, the Jewish people. We might say it's um, a book about how to live today. How to live. It's a book to teach us about God. We might say it's a book to teach us about what we're supposed to do, uh, you know, our ethics. Um, We might think it's a book that is supposed to uh, speak to us um, and lead us to repentance and prayer and so on. Um, It's a book that's supposed to teach us about the ways that we're supposed to interact with God's world, with each other, with our neighbors, and so on. Um, There's a a million things that we can say about the Old Testament, but what I'd like to say is that there are three basic categories here. There's kind of ancient history, and 
the Bible is a story about the ancient world. I mean, these people do not live in the contemporary world. They're not part of any of our cultures. The ancient Near East, that is the ancient cultures of the ancient world around where the Bible was written and about the peoples who lived in the areas about which the Bible speaks, they aren't like us, any of us. I mean, even people who live in the Middle East today, they're connected in some ways, many of them, to the cultures, uh, the ancient cultures about which the Bible speaks. But there are significant differences. It's been thousands of years um, since those people lived. Um, there, there are Arabs mentioned in the Bible, but the Arab peoples today um, are very different from Arabs who lived 3,000 years ago, right? So we can say that there's, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between the ancient world and us today. Um, this middle category here, we can say that the Bible is literature. It's written in as stories and as poems. Um, it's written as um, particular kinds of poems, right? Uh, it's written in particular kinds of songs. It's written as particular kinds of liturgies. Um, uh, we, we can think about the Bible um, and think about the, uh, the, the stories in it and the poems in it using the same kinds of tools that we might use to study other kinds of literature and other kinds of poetry or songs, um, other kinds of rituals, right? We can use those tools that people have d uh, devised to study um, those different types of literature and culture to be able to think about the Bible in those terms. But we can also think about the Bible in terms of ourselves and our own world. What are we supposed to get out of the Bible, us here today, the ones who are alive right now? Um, what is God saying to us right now? What I'd like to say is that all three of those are right. All three of those things are true and correct and are true about the Bible. So here, I got uh, my, my little prop here. Um, it's uh, not really a prop. I mean, you'll see me use this, actually open it up and read through throughout the semester. But this is um, um, one of my Bibles. Um, this is the New Interpreter Study Bible. It's a, it's a good um, study Bible. Uh, the HarperCollins, you'll see me use a lot too. That's the one that we've um, suggested that you uh, purchase. I, I do think it's an excellent study Bible. Um, I think the HarperCollins is the best. My copy is at school at my office, but, um, but I do like it a lot. But this right here, the Bible, um, it, it's a complicated text. It's very complex. Uh, the ancient forms of the Bible, the most ancient manuscripts we have, don't have a table of contents like this. This is the table of contents of this Bible. But we put that there. Editors put that there after many centuries. And in fact, different Christian communities have argued about what's in or out of the Bible. Uh, one of those words that we use to talk about the Bible is the canon, which means a C-A-N-O-N. Uh, not like a cannon that fires, like boom, a cannon, uh, but a cannon which comes from a, a Greek word which means a, a measuring stick. Uh, so a canon, uh, is, in a literary sense, uh, and about scripture, and when we talk about scripture, um, is uh, a, 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 a group of books that have been declared holy. Um, and we need to realize that different communities of Christians have declared different groups of books holy. Not completely different groups of books, but slightly different groups of books. Um, so this right here, uh, this one and yours that you have, the HarperCollins, they have the Apocrypha in it. And they're also the New Revised Standard Version. Um, uh, so this is, a, this is a, a, a tricky little bunch of words here, the New Revised Standard Version. Um, new meaning there's old translations, uh, revised meaning that this one's been revised and updated. It's standard, which means there's non-standard ones out there. And it's a version, which means there's one of many. Uh, so uh, yeah, and it's the New Interpreter Study Bible. I guess it was the old one. And then it's interpreters because we have to read it and interpret it and we have to study it. Uh, and then there's the word Bible, which means library, an ancient library of books. Um, so all to say that we, we often think of the Bible as something that's um, very, uh, kind of simple, easy. It, it just fell out of the sky and we caught it and now we give it to other people. But in fact, um, very, since the very beginning, uh, since the time of Jesus, uh, there were scribes and ancient scholars who were hard at work trying to figure out which writings were sacred and which writings were not and which copies of the sacred writings were more sacred or the ones that we wanted to use in our communities because there are different versions of some ancient books. So I'll just say a lot of work has gone, on, gone into this, um, but also we can think about this book, this Bible, um, in several different ways. There's a French philosopher, uh, Paul Ricoeur, um, uh, who, who came up with a very interesting way of thinking about books 
and I, I'd, I'd like to pr uh, present this as an idea for us. He said, every time you open up a book, you can think about it in three different ways. You can think about it as if it's a window to the past. So the questions that you ask when you're thinking about a book as a window to the past would be who wrote this and why did they write this and when did they write this and what was the what was going on in the world when they wrote this let's think about something other than a bible how about like a, a biography of a famous person uh, the biography of martin luther king jr who lived here in atlanta by the way um, so let's say the the biography of martin luther king jr uh, there are different ways to write that story and there are different attempts at that biography uh, that have occurred throughout this is since his life. Uh, so we, we could ask questions. What, what, what did this author want to do? Or what did that author want to do? Why did they choose to arrange the story this way? Or why did they choose to not put that part of the story in? So we can ask lots of questions uh, about the authors and what kind of access or source materials they had access to or why they chose to put certain things in and not. And what, what, why were they trying to write this particular biography, right? What were they trying to do with it? What, who were they speaking to? What was their audience? That might shape the way that you write a biography, right? If you're writing to uh, an audience that is predominantly worried about Martin Luther King Jr., let's say um, an audience of white Americans um, in the 1970s uh, who are fairly conservative, you might write about Martin Luther King Jr. in a, a different way, maybe a more persuasive way, trying to get people to understand him and sympathize with him and under, understand from their own uh, convictions um, why his life would have been important. Um, maybe why he isn't uh, saying some of the things people have, have, have said about him, right? He's, he, uh, uh, some people have lied about what he said or tried to make him a scary figure and so on. Um, but then maybe you can also think uh, there are other audiences you might be writing for, like a group of scholars who are scholars of the civil rights movement, who know a lot, they, people they already know about Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. They don't need to be persuaded he's important. Um, and you would write in a very different way for that audience. So we might think about about a book. We might, when we read a book, we might think about what's behind it, really. Almost like the book is a window, right? Behind me is a is a window of my uh, to my neighbor's yard. Here, I'll show you. There's my window that I look through every day, and you can see my neighbor's yard. You can imagine the Bible a little bit like a window to a past. It tells us something about the ancient world, about ancient Israel in particular. And it shows us this world that is surprising to us and that we, we don't know about entirely. There are a lot of questions we have, even basic questions about what life was like back then. But it does show us these particular stories of what happened back then. So then, in order to understand that, that text better, what we have to do is understand that world better. And what we can do now in, in the 19th and 20th century, there have been enormous strides that have taken place in archeology, span in associated fields, like the study of Egyptian history, the study of Mesopotamian history, what they call Assyriology, the study of the Assyrian Empire and Assyrian history, the study of the Persian Empire, the study of uh, Alexander the Great and the Hellenistic kingdoms, which included Judea, which was conquered then, um, the study of the Roman Empire and so on, which included Judea, a province of the Roman Empire where Pilate was governor for a time, remember? So if we study these other empires, these other cultures, we can learn a little bit in comparison about ancient Israel. Um, it, it shouldn't surprise us that ancient Israel is a part of these ancient cultures. Ancient Hebrew is a form of Canaanite speech. Um, Abram and Isaac and Jacob and the, 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 the matriarchs as well, uh, they spoke a language that the peoples around them when they were in, moving around in Canaan understood. They spoke Canaanite. Uh, Hebrew is basically Canaanite. So uh, they understood Canaanite worship practices. They understood Canaanite uh, uh, culture, right? And they were a part of it too. They moved around in it. Uh, they, 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 they didn't in, inhabit a culture that fell from the sky and was completely different from everything around them. So. All to say what we can do when we look at the Bible sometimes is understand that world behind the text as if you're looking through a window. So this is that when we think about our questions of ancient history, who wrote this? When did they write this? We're asking questions about the world behind the text as if the text is a window to the past. Okay, but there's also this uh, other world we can talk about, this world of like stories and characters and plot and poetry and songs and uh 
the, the climax, the denouement of the story and the setting and so on, these literary terms. Uh, so this French thinker Paul Ricoeur said, instead of thinking about the world, uh, the, the book as just a window to the past, right? Instead of thinking of it as a, uh, the, in terms of the world behind the text, we can think of the world in the text um, this is uh, a way of saying we can think about the Bible as a piece of literature in the same way that if we look at a painting, like a famous painting, right, uh, we might ask questions like, what was that painter thinking that day? What did they eat for breakfast? Uh, why did the painter paint this painting, right? We might think uh, something like, um, uh, uh, was the painter trying to say something about their own day and age, about their culture? Uh, were they reacting against their mentor or their teacher, right? Were they trying to um, impress someone in particular or speak out against some very particular practice that was happening in their day with their art, right? We can ask those questions when we look at Van Gogh or uh, Monet or something, um, but we can also ask the question, let's set aside all that stuff about history in the past and let's just look at it. Let's just look at the painting. Right? What does it say to you? What kind of colors does the painter use? What kind of paint strokes does the painter use? Um, how does it work as a painting? And, and not thinking about it as only tied to some past um, or trying to say something uh, about a world that doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's a good question, you know, would a painter like Vincent Van Gogh, who painted, you know, Starry Night, right? The famous beautiful painting. Uh, when Vincent Van Gogh painted Starry Night, does he want people to only ask questions about when he painted it? Or what did the city of Arles in France look like when he painted it? Uh, or did he alter any of the buildings or the streetscape when he painted it? Um, or how did he make his colors that he used in his dye? Or what kind of paintbrush did he use? Where, who made the paintbrushes that Vincent Van Gogh bought and where did he buy them, right? Those are all interesting questions. Um, we shouldn't discount them. But the secret of the painting might not be held in all of those historical questions, right? Uh, one other way to engage the painting is to think about it just as a painting. So when we read biblical poetry, the Song of Songs or something, we might say, oh, that's about Solomon or something. I actually think those historical associations stop us from reading the Song of Solomon very carefully. So for example, um, you read the Song of Solomon, and you kind of put out of your head the idea that uh, this is supposed to be about something historical, and instead you just read it as a poem. It can become beautiful as a poem, uh, and it can speak to us about the beauty in the world. And there's theology to be had there too. We can learn something about God from learning that God loves poetry that just celebrates the beauty of the world. Uh, so in any event, that's, that's one thing we can do. We can study characters. We can study the how different Hebrew um, uh, narrators uh, narrate a story, what the pacing of the story is, what the plot is like. We'll talk about these things in class. Um, but that, those are questions about the world in the text. Right, so as in as in the text itself is its own world. So there's the world behind the text, the historical setting. There's the world of the text, the world that the text generates in a way with its own story, with its own uh, poetry. But then also we can say that there is a third world here, the world that's really about us or. Jewish people, or uh, the way it speaks uh, um, to uh, people of, of many different kinds of faiths, um, or the way it speaks to us ethically. How do we understand what the Old Testament says ethically about the Bible, right? So we can say uh, that there is this uh, third world, a world in front of the text. Uh, that's me, the reader, taking into account the fact that I am a person, that every single uh, time that the Bible is read, the Bible is read by a person, a person who lives in a particular context now, a person who has their own life story, who has their own uh, convictions, who has their own uh, biases, who has their own prejudices, um, a person who has their own expectations about what to get out of the text. A person who has their own theological convictions. What is you know what, what do I believe about God? Those are going to change the way that I understand the biblical text and how the biblical text works. So that is the world in front of the text, and we can we can talk about that between ourselves. But one of the things we can't do in this class is expect that everyone is going to agree with us on any of these levels, but especially about that level in front of the world in front of the text. Well, what I think we do best at Columbia Seminary is to respect each other's worlds in front of the text and to expect that God is active within each of us and within each of our communities, which may be different, which may have different expectations and assumptions, 
and which may lead us and guide us to different ways to read these texts today. So in the first semester of our class, we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about these uh, questions of the world behind the text. The reason we're going to do that, that's not the only way to read the Bible. These are kind of like three different ways to read the Bible. I kind of hope we, we all learn to read all three of these ways at the same time. We think about the historical questions. We think about the literary questions. Uh, we think about the contemporary uh, ethical issues. Uh, I think all of those are connected, but it does help in some ways to separate our questions. So when you have a question, sometimes ask yourself, is this a question about the world behind the text? the world in the text or the world in front of the text. Uh, and that might help you kind of organize some of your questions and your thoughts. And it might help us talk to one another too. Because if you want to say no to someone in their reading, it might help for you to think for a second and say, no, I'm not disagreeing with them. I'm just, I have a different world in front of the text. I occupy a different space as a reader. Um, so for me, I'm a white man. Uh, I'm an American. I'm an Episcopalian. Uh, I am a tenured professor. Uh, I occupy a particular position that's probably going to lead me to ask particular questions about the text, to bring particular assumptions to it, to notice certain things in the text, and to miss certain other things. And I have been... Um, uh, so blessed uh, to have learned so much from people who are not like me when I've paid attention to what they're saying about how they read that they've shown me things in the text that I have missed. I've missed in part because I didn't see it because I didn't have the lived experience that allowed me to see certain things in the text. And maybe there are some things that I can see in the text, in part because of my training and Professor Yoder, because of her training uh, in ancient languages and ancient archaeology, ancient history. There are certain things that we can help uh, bring to light in this class, too. So all to say, uh, when we think about the biblical text, let's think about how complex this is. And let's think about the world behind the text, the world in the text, and the world in front of the text. And as we move through this year, the first semester we'll spend more time behind the text and in the text, but we'll always be asking these questions about what's in front of the text, but the, we'll forefront the questions about behind the text this semester. As we move on and into next semester, we'll move into the world in front of the text and spend more time asking questions about our own identities as readers and the identities of the people who we're reading who comment about the Bible, but then also the identities and the issues of identity that we see play at play in the text itself. So uh, I hope uh, that hasn't been too confusing. Um, please feel free to ask questions about it uh, in the comments, uh, in the discussion forums and so on. Um, and uh, I would love to hear from you all. Uh, and uh, if this has been a bit confusing, just just wait too. And when we're, we'll continue to use this terminology of the world behind the text, like the text is a window, the world in the text where the text is like a painting. And then the world in front of the text, like the text is a bit of like a mirror, right? Where we're seeing ourselves a bit and a bit of ourselves in the text. Um, and and the, the, we'll use those, those images and those, those terms um, throughout the semester to be able to guide um, our, our own understanding of the biblical text. Well, it's been fun to be with you all, and I look forward so much to this semester. Uh, we, we can't wait to meet you digitally, and uh, we look forward to engaging you and learning from you as well. Peace.